recording in progress. Oh, it's recording. Uh, let's open with prayer. Uh, dear Lord God, uh, we thank you for the blessing of the fourth commandment, where you tell us to honor our father and mother and all those in authority over us for the blessing of a long life on the earth. Um, as we strive to keep this commandment, we're reminded that Jesus kept it perfectly for us in our place. And that we look at these uh, wise words of Proverbs as a way in which uh, we can be encouraged to keep the fourth commandment. Uh, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, you have on your sheet there before you, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on the earth. You know how I summarize this to my kids? Um, listen to your mommy and your daddy. And that's a short and brief summary. Respect for parents will play itself in the long run of how do you respect others in authority, right? For sure. So parents, right? You've seen how this has played out in life. Uh, good, bad, and indifferent. Every child is different. Every child needs a different amount of love and discipline. And uh, we love them the best way that we can, the best way that God has equipped us to. And um, right, we pray, dear Lord, help me do this more and more. Okay, um, Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When you think of a Christian good work you could do, what comes to mind first? Um, my first thought is what Julie was just talking about, you know, serving the homeless. Okay, serving others, serving the homeless. Very good. Changing diapers. <laughs> that is a good work. <laughs> yes, changing diapers. Uh, and when you can give other parents a hand in doing that, right? Any other thoughts? You know, one of the, go ahead. A little million of them. I mean, Judy brings Phyllis every week to church. Mm -hmm. That's a good work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah most definitely. Uh, you think of this passage and one of the changes in translation to the NAV 2011, for example, is we are God's handiwork. Instead of we are his workmanship. And yeah, um, God's created us. God's formed us. Why? To do what? You know, we're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. God didn't create us just to occupy space. He's created us for far more than that. And we think of the ways in which we have an opportunity to do that with the fourth commandment. When you think of a summary of the law, Jesus would say later on in life, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So we think of that as the two tables of the law. Love God, love your neighbor. And if you were to summarize, well, how am I created to do good works and what Christian good works could come? You could summarize it in that way because it is a summary of the law. Love God and love neighbor. So the first three commandments we say are focused on God, right? Have no other gods. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Um, keep his name holy. And then uh, third commandment, right, is remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Now commandments four through ten, we'll see a shift. And it's that aspect of how can we love our neighbor? Well, love your neighbor by loving mom and dad. Listen to mom and dad. Listen to those in authority over you. Now, consider what your parents or another significant adult in your life has done for you. Not all of us have had loving parents. When you consider the love and care of your parents or another significant adult, what comes to mind first? It would be the fact that my parents brought us up to be Christians, 
go to church every Sunday, read the Bible, you go you know, pray, and that just made everything else in the household go that much better because you, you automatically learn respect and um, care. So I think just being raised Christian is the primary thing for me. That's right. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> except when except when all of us would get in the car waiting for mom and dad to come and the um, older sisters would burn my ankles with the cigarette maker. That wasn't very oh, nice. Ooh. Told mom I had ring them. Do you don't ring them? <laughs> no, you were too little. <sighs> Who no, who's the youngest? Uh, Jim, brother, yeah. but she's I'm the youngest girl. Younger, and, then we have a brother yeah. and I'm yeah. very in the middle, so yeah. I was picked on. <laughs> Oldest and youngest siblings. I, I'm an oldest child, so I get where you're going with that. Plus I did not burn a cigarette later <laughs> into my sister's brother. Plus, we told her she was adopted, yeah. which is the oh. only one. For years, I thought I was adopted. My mother said, why would I adopt another girl? Oh, I'm going to three. Good point. Yeah, exactly. Very true. Oh, in a nine-year-old's mind, though, it doesn't make sense. So. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Um, when you consider love and care of your parents, uh, what comes to mind first? Any other thoughts? I think as a parent myself, okay. I realize all of the effort and time and patience and endurance it takes to raise a child. And so I'm very appreciative of what they've done for me. And I don't think kids can understand that until they're raising children at their own home. <laughs> I agree with that because Joshua, I cut Joshua's hair the other night and he said, Kennedy is the only person in the whole world that he has 100% patience with. <laughs> Nobody else, but yeah. Yep. It changes with children, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Does. yeah. yeah. And uh, we can look at our upbringing, good or bad, right? And we can all also see, eh, my parents weren't perfect either. But what did they have on their heart? They wanted to keep the fourth commandment and raise their kids, like you said, to respect others in authority, um, to love God and love neighbor. How, how do you handle situations where the parents very blatantly fell short? And neglected their responsibilities. And, I mean, how do you show respect when... That's the case. Uh, abuse or yeah, that is a very difficult thing to do. I have never had to deal with a matter of, you know, even if it were to borderline emancipation. Uh, but I have had the opportunity to work with parents who were struggling uh, mm -hmm. with this too. And the encouragement to them was continually basically, how do you get healthy physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally? because that's playing itself out in your life and how you raise your children. Because if you're not healthy mentally and emotionally, for example, um, uh, let's say use the reference that you did, let's say alcoholism was in the picture. Um, how do you think that's gonna affect your, your parenting and your raising of your kids? Uh, I mean, book after book is written on alcoholism, for example, and, and the effects it has on a family. Uh, it's called codependency for a reason. And all of those things are negative effects. And I guess the key is, is right, read God's word, study it, meditate it, and take it apart. Um, how does God's word impact me? What is God saying to me? Um, right, today's the, the Reformation Sunday of sorts. Uh, Luther had a way to look at God's word and how do you reflect on it? Um, how do you study the Bible? And to get parents um, to do that um, is part of the process of discipleship and part of the process that God wants parents to do with their kids. Yeah, I see where you're coming from the parent standpoint, but what do you say to the kids? Uh, what do you say to the kids? Yeah, that is a difficult one, isn't it? Well, what would you say? Is it okay to rebel? Like we would say to government, um, like the apostles said, um, we must obey God rather than that. Maybe not, maybe not rebelling, but the thing about respecting. Yeah. That's, 
Oh, like, are hard. you saying how do you, how do you encourage how do you them to respect the parents who are falling short? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Yes, that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to ask. And yeah. you keep saying something else. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Until you said that at last, it wasn't yeah. clear what you were getting at. But yeah. yeah. Um, I guess just that this is a command that God has instituted. And as hard as it may be, you know, and, and at the moment it may not make sense to you, but somewhere down the road. Well, and, and you also have to remember that these children need to understand, like you, you talk about alcoholism or drug abuse, something like that, that is illness, it's disease. It's So you still have to love the parent, not their behavior, but you still have to love and respect the parent and pray and pray and pray that they get help. Yeah, and ultimately, well, I see respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, sorry. okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And at, and at the end of the day, God tells us in the Bible, in any matter of suffering that we might have to undergo, sometimes it is at the hand of a parent. Unfortunately, God tells us in the Bible, suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Um, you might go through a lot of those trials at a young age. And what hope and comfort can you go through when you're going through them? Yeah. It would be a matter. Of, yeah, it'd be a matter of hard to understand. Right? First and foremost, you have a heavenly father who loves you, even though your dad here on earth might not love you. Or um, talking through with families who have had someone be adopted. Right. Your, your dad's out of the picture now, but your dad in heaven is that. And what great comfort it is to take in that. Does it stink? Absolutely. Because God portrays himself as a heavenly father for a reason. He wants earthly dads to display that type of love for their children so that they can gain a proper understanding of his love for us. Much in the same way mothers and fathers as parents do that and display that for their children. So, right, in the equation that Ginny had given, you know, it's the parents who are very much far out of step and it's the kids who are not, right? What would you do in the reverse of that if the parents were in line with they're doing the right things, but they have an Absalom for a son? Kind of the same thing, you have to, you know, work at it day after day and pray. I think as an adult, it's easier to go to the scripture. If you're a 10 year old and your parents are drinking or whatever, it's a little harder to find things here um, mm -hmm. and understand them. Mm -hmm. But counseling, you yeah. know, Christian counseling. Uh, Christian counseling would be very key uh, in those instances. Absolutely. Um, how would we not all benefit from a heavy dose of encouragement in scripture? Right. This is what God says. Um, that's why God calls all of us to meditate on God's word and to be blessed by it. That's what the blessed man, woman, and child does. Um, meditates on scripture regularly. Great thoughts. Uh, any others? Take a look at Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7. How often should parents teach their law, kids law and gospel? 284. Thank you, Jane. When, when I first did this uh, in Iowa, um, I had these same exact Bibles, the NAB large print, and it helped when everyone had the same one and had the opportunity to, oh, 284. I love the large print. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, part of the reason, though, is too, kids in confirmation class not the same just as far as like knowing their bible or the place where it is and getting them up to speed takes half the year if not a whole year so shall i read it yeah go ahead why don't you read all uh, all four verses there hear o israel the lord our god the lord is one love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength these commandments that i give you today are to be upon your hearts Compress them on the children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, all the time. Okay. So how often should parents teach their children law and gospel? 
all the time. Uh, what words stand out to you to impress that on you that you're supposed to talk about them all the time? No matter what you're doing. Okay. No matter what you're doing around the house, outside, work in the garden. And you're looking for opportunities as opposed to saying, okay, this is Sunday morning, they're going to Sunday school. Right. And then we wait until next Sunday and they go to school. Yeah. No. Yeah. And not just at meal time when you say your meal prayer and things like mm -hmm. that. It's almost it's kind of interesting to pick up Molly and Maggie from St. Paul's school. Yeah. On Wednesday. And they get in the back seat on their car seats, and all of a sudden Molly just starts rattling off the Apostles' Creed. And I thought, <laughs> okay, she is taking the opportunity every time she gets sealed to. I believe this is what I believe in, Grandma. Yeah, yeah. And I thought. Hmm, did you just learn it? Oh, we've been learning it, you know, but she just rattled it off. And I thought, most kids are like, turn on the radio and want to sing along or something. Yeah. It's cool. yeah. Just, yeah, just the fact that parochial school is just the, that. Where they're that's memorizing it, yeah. yeah. That and and I see that difference way. between the, the, the parochial school and the public school. Um, the one thing, though, that, like, I've noticed, too, is why do you memorize these things? Oh, I got to memorize more. You know, you don't want people to dread studying God's word or, or memorizing these things. Um, but how do they, how do kids come to grow in appreciation of it? Right? It's parents taking opportunity to talk to their kids about Jesus. Um, when you lie down and when you get up, right? So, Six, eight hours, however long you sleep at night, kids need 10. Um, you're not talking about it, but from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed, you're talking about it. When you walk along the road, right? In the car ride on the way to school. That's how I take it very literally uh, and apply it to my own life. Um, impress it on your children. What does it say? Put it on their foreheads. Now, I'm not going to brand it on them. <laughs> But how do you take that very figuratively? Don't let them forget it. You might be thinking, I'm just, you're a pastor, dad. You know, I, I don't want my kids to, to think of, well, you're a pastor, therefore you have to do it. I want to, them to think of me, well, you're, you're a Christian father, um, doing the things that God has asked you to do um, in raising us as children. Right. So even when I have those opportunities to have a devotion with them in the car, I have an opportunity at that very time to talk about law and gospel. I have an opportunity to confess my own sins to them. I'm sorry I wasn't as patient with you yesterday as I could have been in the car ride on the way to school when that day's devotion is all about patience. And hopefully, right, they get to the point of, yeah, I've got my own mistakes and failures and sins too. Um, and I need a savior just as much as you do. And you do things like that. Um, and it continues uh, to be a blessing um, in life. If only I would have known this right when I became a parent, right? It takes a little bit of trial and error to get there. So, okay. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, let's read the following Proverbs. So turn to Proverbs 1. Uh, we'll start with 8 and 9 there. And then um, as we go through, just mark your favorite proverb and why you chose it. Um, what we'll do is we'll read one of these uh, Proverbs sections um, and then uh, skim through a few more um, I'll allow you the opportunity to right, take take some of this home here today and read through it as well. Uh, does someone have one eight to nine that they'd like to read? Okay, okay, go ahead. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They will be a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Okay. So how, what's the point that uh, we learned there? Benefit from it. Okay, so in Proverbs, right, wisdom is often personified sometimes even as a lady or a female. Um, here, <laughs> yes, very much so. 
Um, but here we're talking about dads. So like I, I, I did not read the Hebrew of this, but I'm sure that there would be a male ending of a, um, of a noun here. But anyways, um, hear my son, your father's instruction. The point is, right, your, your father's instruction is the thing that um, is the focus here. Um, your mother's teaching is the thing that's focused here. Listen to your mom and dad. Is this the fourth commandment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, verses one and two of chapter three. Uh, go ahead, Diane. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Okay. Does this sound like a summary of the what does this mean? or a full explanation, right? That you may enjoy a long life on the earth and that it may go well with you. Absolutely. And by prosperity in there, I don't view that as, oh, you're going to get riches. You're going to have a rich, fulfilled life. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is one thing that we can use as a common example, right, for parents instructing their kids? At a young age, you tell them, don't put your hand on the stove because you'll burn yourself right that's hot don't pull the pan of hot water on you it's hot you'll scald yourself right dangers that we try and keep our kids away from um, the prosperity there is well you won't get burned and that's teaching them in a small thing but how they deal with others in authority how they go about their faith life um, how they handle finances, all sorts of things that you have the opportunity to instruct them. Okay, chapter four. Uh, let's read uh, one through four. Oh, uh, you have that there, Judy? Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction, pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and, and only child of my mother, he taught me and said, Lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and God and you will live. <clears throat> okay, so the thought there is again, listen to instruction. And I like the idea that they emphasize when he's a tender youth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear people saying, well, when he's old enough, he can make a decision whether oh, he yeah. wants to be. Oh, yeah. uh, Join a church or <laughs> uh, which high school you'll go to. Um, whether or not you want to play on this sports team. I'm just thinking of the things <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, right, but yeah, there are many more uh, that certainly are very, um, very serious in nature than two. Okay, uh, let's read. Uh, the next couple of verses there in chapter 4, 20 to 22. Um, would you like to read, Phyllis? Would you want to read? No? Okay. Uh, I can do it. I'm yeah. Okay. That's understandable. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Yeah. Um, the new translation is healing to all their flesh. So uh, what is the point there with those verses? Again, listen to the instructions. Yeah. Listen to, there's a general theme here. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay, five verses one to two. Uh, you wanna read that, Wendy? My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen well to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Okay. Yeah, yeah definitely. Discretion, for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. This puts a heavy mm -hmm. responsibility on parents. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. that they don't often take <laughs> or forget. Mm -hmm. you in your daily life you, you know parochial education is wonderful but you are the bottom line uh absolutely you've been given a great deal of knowledge um certainly that instruction in god's word 
However, how do you guard it and maintain it? Is is one of the ways. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Uh, chapter six. Uh, would you read there, Diane? Uh, 20 to 23. My son, keep your father's commands and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them upon your heart forever. Fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. For these commands are a lamp. This teaching is a light. And the corrections of discipline are the way to light. Okay, what stood out to you there? It's like this is a standard that's going to serve you well. Yeah. Uh, do you see any uh, similarities between verse 21 here and Deuteronomy 6 that we just read? Yeah. Bind them on your heart, tie them in around your neck. When you walk, they'll lead you. When you lie down, they'll watch over you. Uh, can you read verse 22 again, Diane? 22. Yeah. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. Okay. I'm always curious to see the difference in translation to that last phrase is when you awake, they will talk with you. They will talk with you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of like the, the old translation there. A little bit more. Why are you talking to yourself? <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, uh, there's a very much a similarity here in verse 23 to Psalm 119. Verse 105, Psalm 119, 105 is your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Um, how about the reproofs of discipline are the way of life? In verse 23 there. Oh, they say reproofs instead of corrections. Mm -hmm. How many people like correction or discipline? Uh, discipline is something that I lack as a strength. That is, is not a, a strong suit of mine. However, I'm very thankful that other people help provide that to me. <laughs> okay, chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 7, 1 through 3. Would you read that there, Judy? My son, keep my words and store up my commands with you. Keep my commands and you, and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Find them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Okay, uh, so what's the thought there? Is it similar to Deuteronomy 6 again? Mm -hmm. I think if you follow that, you will live a godly life. Okay. You may fall, but you're always going to go back. And yeah, and keep them as the, the apple of your eye. Yeah, it's not just duty, it's it's your heart here that's involved. Okay. Very good. Uh, 22, verse 28, and 23, 22. I'll read those two. 22, verse 28. And then you can tell me how it differs from, uh, from your translation as well. Do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. Here's, here's a thought from Matthew 5, verse 5. The arrogant could irrigate land by moving markers. The meek shall inherit the earth. Matthew 5, verse 5. It's interesting. I don't know if I've ever... Would have thought of it that way. Okay. 
kind of like, don't mess with God's word. <laughs> yeah. Don't change it to suit what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, 23 verse 22. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if you disagree with them? Mm -hmm. No. And be there for them when they become the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a great way to serve. Oh, most definitely. They took care of me all them years. Same. Still do. <laughs> How can I ever repay you? Okay, just a couple questions. Uh, we'll finish up our conversation and discussion here for today. Um, how did your parents discipline you? And if you're a parent, how do you discipline your ch children? Um, any any way that you would put like, hey, what's a, a philosophy um, that you like to live by? How do we be disciplined? Yell at them a lot. Yeah, mostly. Yard yeah, stick once in a while. <laughs> um, Dad was never the disciplinary. No, he was. Yes, that was your job. Yeah, extra oh, work. Go work in the garden. Yeah, go work in the garden. Yeah. 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 And I think, okay. I think I carried that over into our family. Gary is not a disciplinarian at all. He doesn't want to hear about it, doesn't want to hear about things that went wrong with the kids. So I was pretty much the disciplinarian all the time. Yeah. Sometimes I like to be a problem identifier and a problem solver. And I don't take enough time to just listen. Like even when it comes to the kids fight. Well, this is what I heard. This is what's going to happen. <laughs> Slow down just a minute. Um, it might seem as if I'm jumping to conclusions but like I tell my wife, well, that's what I do. And sometimes I get caught up in it because that's my strength. Um, Ginny had asked uh, about my own discipline. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about my parents. It's just the opposite of yours um, in that my dad was gone most of the time. And my mom was not the disciplinarian. So her line was, wait till your father gets home. And that was just hanging over our heads. And that poor guy, he had to, you know, meet out this punishment without knowing the whole situation, <laughs> wow. yeah. extenuating circumstances. <laughs> Mom's the judge and the jury. I'm the, the so, carry out. Yeah, so there was a fear built up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll sum up mine, at least the way that I think about it. Um, yeah. Hebrews uh, 12, 5 to 11. Um, this is what I like to think of. This is the way that it was shared with me when I was a kid, right? I, I got that a lot because my dad was working 80 hours a week trying to get a school started. Wait until your father gets home. All the time. You know that too. Then. I know that all the time. Yep. Mom broke many of wooden spoons and made us sit in the orange chair, but nothing was the same as dad's discipline. Okay, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses its son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. I feel that my responsibility as a parent, right? God speaks to me in his word and says, do this as a dad. Don't exasperate your children but instead bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's he, or Ephesians chapter six. Uh, but he also tells me here, right? Discipline is done for a reason and connected always to the cross. I heard from my dad and such a great example, just all the time. I'm punishing you because I love you. And if you don't ever connect it to love, well, you're probably going to go to not appreciate it uh, pretty quickly. And that's the hard thing, right? Who as a parent loves to see their kids suffer? No one does. 
but you know that they need it and they need it for a reason. You don't want them to come, grow up to be a spoiled brat or whatever it might be, right? But this is the discipline that they need. Um, I feel that weight and responsibility all the time. And sometimes even if my wife and I disagree on it, right? And that's, those are the opportunities as parents, right? Let's get on the same page here. What do you think needs to be done in this instance? Um, don't do it in front of the kids. <laughs> a house divided <laughs> will not stand. Yep. Back off when you're angry. Don't punish when you're angry. And that was hard. Walk away. <laughs> Walk away. That's right. Walk away. So very good. Um, yeah, I encourage you if you have opportunity here. Uh, what we'll do next time is just touch up on um, 7 through 12. Uh, we'll probably spend a good 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we talked about a heavy dose of parenting. Uh, next week, we'll touch up on um, some of uh, government and those in authority in the church, right? Maybe spend 10 minutes on each, and then uh, we'll move on to the fifth commandment. Uh, let's go ahead and close with prayer. Uh, dear Lord Jesus, again, in the fourth commandment, you remind us of uh, the blessing of keeping it, right? That it will go well with us and, and, and bring us a long life on the earth. Um, help us to honor and obey our parents and those in authority over us uh, for these blessings and can continue to bless us in every way as we hear these wonderful words of wisdom and Proverbs and we seek to live them in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Very good.